What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and we have so much to talk about today in terms of new data sheets, stratagems, enhancement abilities, all sorts of stuff that has been revealed over on the Warhammer live stream. They've been live all day today, not only with a show match, but also showcasing data sheets and new unit stat cards for the new edition of the game. And it is super exciting. If you're looking for some context for what we're going to be talking about today, I do have a playlist of videos over on my channel talking about spoilers and reveals for, for the new edition. We had a bunch of data sheets spoiled previously and a lot of the abilities that will be meshing into the data sheets we talk about today were revealed in faction focus articles, which are available there. So you can go check those out. I talk about all of those and break them down exhaustively on the channel. So please go watch those videos if you need some context here. I'm not going to be diving into the background of these data sheets too much. I'm basically just going to be telling you the information that we got over the course of the live stream. Now, yesterday we watched Chaos Demons versus Death Guard fight it out, and we got a ton of new data sheets for Chaos Demons, but we've gotten even more spoiled today, including a couple new stratagems. The first one of these is the Realm of Chaos. This is used at the end of your opponent's turn and allows you to put two demon units into reserve. These arrive during your next reinforcement step with the Deep Strike ability. Meshing with demonic manifestation mechanics, other stratagems like the Denizens of Chaos that allows you to come in within three inches, and stealing opponent's objectives away from them. The other stratagem that we got spoiled was Demonic Invulnerability. This is a reactive stratagem you use when you're targeted by an enemy ranged attack in their shooting phase, and and allows you to reroll saving throws of one until the end of that phase for a targeted demon unit. This is certainly going to make it more difficult to kill those big greater demons when they're suffering a ton of small hits, which is usually how you get through their good invulnerable saves. Now, in terms of those demons, let's dive in and talk about some data sheets. The first one we have is the Torment Bringer. This is a mounted Herald of Slanesh and comes in with a pretty impressive top profile. A 14 inch move, toughness six, five plus base save, but it does have a four plus invulnerable save, so we won't be using that five plus save very often. An impressive 12 wounds, seven leadership, and three objective control. In terms of its weapons, this thing attacks a ton of times. Six shots with a six inch lash of torment and anti-infantry three assault pistol ranged weapon hitting on threes at strength four ap0 for one damage in melee it attacks a grand total of 23 times eight times with a weapon skill four strength four exalted seeker tongues these have the lethal hits ability and 15 times with a suite of ravaging claws these have devastating wounds and hit on threes at strength four ap1 for one damage. In terms of their special abilities, the unit has the Torment Bringer Aura. This gives sustained hits one to any Slanesh demon units within six inches of the Torment Bringer, including the Torment Bringer themselves. They also have the Hysterical Frenzy Psychic ability. This doesn't work like other psychic abilities. It automatically manifests. You don't have to go through a whole rigmarole to roll a two plus and then take mortal wounds. It just happens when another Slanesh demon unit within six inches is targeted in the fight phase. It gives them a four plus fight on death. So if any models from that unit are destroyed on a four plus, they make their attacks after the attacking models unit has finished making its attacks. This can you be used on anything. So you can't even use it on large monsters like Keepers of Secrets. But again, they only have one model in their unit, so they will just trigger on a single four plus. So it is a little bit dicey. We also have, speaking of Slanesh Demons, the Contorted Epitome. This is a leader that's able to be attached to Demonet units. It comes in with a top profile of nine inch movement, toughness six, a five up save, eight wounds, a seven plus leadership, and a strong objective control value of two. In melee, it attacks with coiled tentacles, d6 additional attacks, hitting on fours at strength five, ap1 for two damage, as well as the output of basically two demonettes, eight ravaging claw attacks with devastating wounds, hitting on twos at strength four, ap1 for one damage. It grants the unit the Swallow Energy ability, which gives the entire unit it's attached to a four plus feel no pain against both mortal wounds and psychic attacks. This is gonna be very useful since mortal wounds are one of the best ways to get around the demonic and vulnerability save. It also has the Horrible Fascination Psychic ability, which is used at the start of your opponent's shooting phase and target an enemy model within 12 inches that is invisibility. This one is a psychic power that works on a two plus. On a one, the Psyker suffers D3 mortal wounds in this case, because the Contorted Epitome has eight wounds and a four plus field of pain against those mortals, it's actually not going to take too much damage from this if it fails. However, 
if it succeeds, you give the enemy minus one to hit for the remainder of the phase. And if you roll a six, they are not eligible to shoot that phase at all. Moving on to Zinj Demons, we see the data sheet for Pink Horrors be spoiled. These guys are very similar to their data sheet in 9th edition. They are a 6 inch move, toughness 3 unit with a 7 plus leadership and OC value of 2. However, if they are reduced to a smaller variety, either blue or brimstone horrors, they are reduce their leadership value down to 8 and go to objective control 1. The entire unit has a 4 plus invulnerable save and attacks with coruscating flames, either pink, blue, or yellow, depending on the color of horror that is attacking. Each of these are 18 inch range and attack 2 times at AP 1 for 1 damage, but their ballistic skill and strength will reduce by 1 for every low rank of horror is shooting it. So the pink horrors hit on threes at strength four, the blue horrors hit on fours at strength three, and the brimstone horrors hit on fives at strength two. In melee, they have a similar effect. The pink horrors hit on fours at strength three, the blue horrors hit on fives at strength three, and the little tiny brimstone horrors hit on fives at only strength two. The reason that there are so many profiles for this unit is because of their split ability. Each time a model from the unit is destroyed, there is a chance on a four plus that it splits into new models. If it's a pink horror, which the unit will start with, you start with just 10 pink horrors in the unit, then it turns into two blue horrors on a 4+. plus. If it's a blue horror, then it adds a single brimstone horror instead. These, basically just like the last incarnation of the unit, trigger if the unit suffers damage but is not destroyed. Just like any of the other demon infantry we've seen, they can equip demonic icons or instruments of chaos. The icons give them a 6 plus leadership value, improving it by 1 and the Instrument of Chaos gives you plus one to your charge rolls. Now, more excitingly, we also saw the data sheet for Kairos Fate Weaver, and we looked at the Lord of Change in the last video I did for the data sheet spoiled yesterday. The Lord of Change with the Everstave is an incredibly powerful psychic powerhouse, able to drop down immense amounts of damage in the shooting phase. And Kairos Fate Weaver is relatively similar, but also has some army support effects. This guy attacks either using the normal version or focusing it to gain the hazardous keyword. The Infernal Gateway in any case is a blasted <laughs> indirect fire psychic power. It fires D6 plus three shots on its normal profile and D3 plus six if it has been focused. But then you have to take that hazardous check after he's finished shooting. Either one hits on twos at strength nine, the focused one is AP three versus the AP two of the normal one. So focusing it gets you an extra AP and makes your number of attacks a little bit more consistent. And all of these are for D3 damage. In melee, he attacks with the Staff of Tomorrow. This is a five attack melee weapon that hits on threes at strength eight AP two for two D3 damage. He can be damaged, reducing his hit roll by one if he's reduced down to seven wounds. However, because he's oftentimes going to be firing his infernal gateways from beyond line of sight, shooting indirect, he actually doesn't really care that much. That just gives him the opportunity to run behind a piece of terrain and fire indirectly with basically no penalty for the rest of the game. His top line profile is pretty impressive. Just like a Lord of Change, he has movement 12 with a toughness of 10, a base 6 plus save, which is not going to be used because he has a 4 plus invulnerable save, an impressive 20 wounds a 6 plus leadership value, and an OC value of 5. He also has his two head abilities. One head looking forward. This gives you the ability to gain a command point when you target a Zinch demon unit within 6 inches of him with a stratagem. When you do, you roll a d6. If you get higher than the current battle round number, you gain a command point. This means that it is easy to get those command points at the beginning of the game, but gets progressively more difficult as the game goes on. On turn 1, it, you only need a 2 plus, on turn 2 you need a 3, on turn 3 you need a 4, on turn 4 you need a 5, and on turn 5 you only gain it on a 6. The other head looking backwards has an Agents of Vect effect where after your opponent uses a stratagem, you can increase the cost of that stratagem for their usage for the remainder of the game. Their first use of the stratagem is normal cost, however, so they get one for free basically, but after that, any time they use that stratagem, they'll have to pay more command points. And importantly, there are no restrictions on what can be targeted with this. So you can do whatever stratagems you want, including things like command rerolls. Now we'll keep on the greater demon theme here and talk about the profile for the great unclean one. This guy has an insane top line profile, movement of seven inches, which is very thematic, toughness 12 with a five plus armor save, four plus invulnerable save, 20 wounds with a six plus leadership and objective control value of five. He does have 
have the damaged ability, so he'll lose one from his hit rolls if he's reduced down to that seven wounds, just like we saw with Kairos Fate Weaver. And the attacks he's going to be using those on are a Plague Flail, a six inch range range weapon attacking D6 plus one times, hitting on threes at strength seven, AP two for two damage. He can also vomit on people, a Torrent Ignore Cover Flamer style weapon with a 12 inch range, D6 plus three attacks, Hitting on twos, which you don't need because uh, torrents, so probably a little bit of a typo there. Strength five, AP two for one damage. That AP two with ignore cover, it's actually going to be pretty good because it's going to be tough to save against this thing. He can also equip a variety of melee attacks. He comes with the Bile Sword, a melee weapon you can either use to strike or sweep with. The strike is a six attack melee weapon, hitting on twos with strength eight AP2 for D6 damage. The sweep, however, doubles his attacks up to 12 at only strength six AP1 for one damage. Additionally, he can e equip a Bile Blade. This gives him three additional attacks and gets the Lethal Hits characteristic, which the Bile Sword, importantly, also has. In fact, all of his melee attacks have Lethal Hits. This attacks three times, hitting on twos at Strength 6, AP 2, two damage. And alternatively, he can use a Doomsday Bell. This has the Reverberating Summons ability, and every time you kill a model with its six attacks, Hitting on twos at strength seven, AP one, two damage. You get to pick a Plague Bearer unit within 12 and add Plague Bearers back to the unit if they were destroyed earlier. Unfortunately, you can't go over their starting strength. You can only return destroyed Plague Bearers, but since this guy has the Demon Lord of Nurgle ability, nearby Plague Bearers are actually gonna be a little bit difficult to kill since he gives them a six plus feel no pain. The Nurgle's Rot ability is also a psychic power that he can use. It's used at the end of your movement phase. You select one enemy unit within 12. Fortunately, Unfortunately, it automatically manifests, you don't have to roll any dice, and it reduces the toughness characteristic of models in that unit by one. Now with that, we also have some undivided demons to talk about. The first one is very cool, the Demon Prince of Chaos. This guy has been totally reworked from his previous editions. He's no longer a leader or lone operator style character. He's basically just a big tank all by himself. He has an eight inch movement, a toughness of 10 with a two plus save, 10 wounds at leadership six with three objective control. Importantly, he has an aura that grants stealth to all demons within six inches of him, including the Demon Prince himself. So that toughness 10 with a two plus save and importantly also a four plus invulnerable is gonna go even farther because he's reducing enemy ranged attacks targeting him, their hit rolls by one. He also has Unholy Vigor, which allows him at the start of any phase to gain a three plus invulnerable save for the remainder of that phase. So if your opponent is lining up to shoot him a bunch of times or is engaging him in melee with something scary, he can turn on his Unholy Vigor and has a very good chance of surviving through it. He has an even better chance of surviving depending on his demonic mark. He can take a Mark of Corn, which gives him plus two strength, Mark of Zinch, which gives him plus three attacks on his Infernal Cannon, which we'll talk about momentarily, a Mark of Nurgle, which gives him plus one toughness, or Mark of Slanesh, which gives him plus two move, getting him up to a 10 inch move. His ranged weapon is his Infernal Cannon. This fires three times at 24 inches, which can go up to six shots if he's a Demon Prince of Zinch. At strength five, EP one for two damage, hitting on twos. Importantly, this can be buffed by other nearby Zinch demons, so he can get plus one strength on this from the Lord of Change. He has equipped with Hellforged weapons, which can either be struck with for six attacks, hitting on twos at strength eight, up to strength 10 if you take the corn mark, AP two for three damage, or a sweep profile with 14 attacks, more than doubling his normal attack value, hitting on twos at strength six, AP zero, for one damage. Now that's not all of the undivided demons that we see because we also have the profile for the soul grinder. And this thing looks absolutely nuts. This guy keeps getting glow ups every edition after edition. He was already pretty good in the ninth edition codex and now he's even crazier in 10th edition. He comes in with a top line profile at move eight, toughness 11 with a three plus armor save, four plus invulnerable save baked in, 14 wounds with a seven plus leadership and OC value of five. He's a scuttling walker, which allows him to move over friendly monster and vehicle models as if they were not there, despite the fact that vehicles can't normally move through other vehicles. And he can move over low terrain features that are four inches in height or less, again, as if they were not there. He can be damaged once he's reduced down to five wounds and has a huge variety of weapons to equip. In melee, he's equipped with an iron claw and swings with either a warp claw or a warp sword. 
either one of them adds extra attacks, but he can only take one of them. The Iron Claw swings five times, hitting on threes at strength 16 AP3 for D6 plus two damage. The Warp Claw gives six more attacks, hitting on threes at strength eight AP1, two damage, pretty good against medium infantry, whereas the Warp Sword is much better against tanks, swinging three times at strength eight AP2, D6 damage. Now, just like the Demon Prince, he can take a Mark of a Chaos God. Each one of them does not change his base profile, but gives him another weapon. If he's a Soul Grinder of Corn, he can use a 2D6 Heavy Flamer profile as his Torrent of Burning Blood. If he's a Demon Prince of Nurgle, he gets a Phlegm Bombardment, a 36 inch range, indirect fire blast weapon with lethal hits, firing D6 plus one shots, hitting on threes at strength seven, AP one, two damage. If he is a Soul Grinder of Slanesh, he gets a Scream of Despair, a Devastating Wounds and Sustained Hit, 24-inch range weapon with six attacks, hitting on threes at Strength 9, AP 2, 2 damage. This one's kind of the headliner for me because it's good against a wide variety of targets. However, if he's looking to crack some armor, he can be a Soul Grinder of Zinch, giving him a Warp Gaze, a Blast 48-inch range D3 shot weapon, hitting on threes at Strength 12, AP2, D6 plus two damage. Basically a Laz Cannon profile with a random number of shots, but trades that for an AP value. Now, last but certainly not least, we have the Blood Crushers of Corn. We do get a little bit of a corn showcase here. They are a mounted unit, but have a good profile. Movement of 10 inches with an impressive toughness of seven, four plus armor save and four plus invulnerable save. That four plus armor save is actually relevant because they can improve that with cover. Four wounds with a seven leadership and objective control value of two, which to be honest is pretty solid. They can take the normal upgrades that we've seen other demon units able to equip. The Instrument of Chaos is very nice, gives them plus one to charge, and they can also take a Demonic Icon to get a six plus leadership. However, the real headliner for them is their Brass Stampede ability. This lets you roll a D6 for each model in the unit after you have completed a charge in engagement range of an enemy unit. You target an enemy in engagement range of one of your models, and then you roll a D6 for each model in the Blood Crusher unit. Importantly, Unlike impact attack effects that we've seen in the past, this does not care how many blood crushers are engaging the enemy. It just rolls for the number. So you can have up to six blood crushers in the unit and potentially even put cavalry characters like heralds in there to make the unit even larger. You can roll uh, for each four plus you roll for each of those models, the enemy unit takes D3 mortal wounds. So on average, they're gonna be dealing one mortal wound for each model in your unit, since the average of a D3 is two, and you have a 50-50 chance to do those two mortal wounds. So a big unit of these guys is gonna do six to seven mortal wounds on average on the charge, which is nuts, especially once you factor in their melee damage as well. They attack two times with a Hellblade, a strength five AP2 two damage weapon that hits on threes, and also get four additional attacks from the Juggernaut they're mounted on. These have the Lance ability, so if they do charge, they get plus one to wound. Unfortunately, they only hit on fours, but at an impressive strength six, EP one for one damage. These guys are really good at clearing light to medium infantry, but they can also plink off some wounds from tanks and larger, more heavily armored enemies if they really need to. Now, in addition, we also saw some more data sheets for the Death Guard faction. The first one to talk about is the Mephitic Blight Haulers, and these guys seem pretty sweet, if the price is right. They have a 10-inch movement at toughness 9, a 3-plus save, 10 wounds apiece with a 6-plus leadership, OC value of 3, and baked in 5-plus invulnerable save. Importantly, they have the Tank Hunter's ability. This gives them plus 1 to wound vehicle units with ranged attacks. So while it doesn't work in melee, their melee attacks are okay, but not great. It does make them very reliable against heavy armor. The weapons they're gonna be benefiting from this with are the Bile Spurt, a lethal hit, three attack weapon with a range of 12, hitting on threes at strength five, AP zero for one damage. In addition, they also can mount a multi melta and missile launcher with profiles that we've seen before. In melee, they attack four times, hitting on threes at strength six, AP one, for one damage with, again, that lethal hits ability. Importantly, if they fire their missile as a frag missile, they actually benefit from the Lord of Virulence's Blight Bombardment ability, which is uh, kind of fun. Makes them hit on twos, so that's cute. We just saw the Demon Prince, so let's take a look at the Death Guard Demon Prince. This is a winged variety, and I think speaks to the fact that we may also see a winged variety for the 
demon demon prince as well. This gives them a little bit of an odd 11 inch movement, but they have that impressive demon prince profile. Toughness 10 with a two plus save, four plus invulnerable save, 10 wounds, leadership value of six and OC value of three. He has the Warp Horror ability. Every time he ends a charge move, he picks one enemy unit within engagement range and forces them to take a Battleshock chest. If they fail that, importantly, they can't be targeted by things like Interrupt Stratagems, which is a very big deal. He also has the Devastating Assault ability. Each time he ends a charge move, he also gains Devastating Wounds in melee. At range, he's firing a Plague Spewer. We've seen the Plague Spewer before, a Strength 5 AP1 Flamer with Anti-Infantry 2+. In melee, he's swinging with his Hellforged weapons, which actually have an identical profile to the ones that we saw on the other Demon Prince. Unfortunately, no lethal hits on these ones, but you can't win them all. Now, we also saw a ton of these support characters that are vital for Death Guard to succeed. The first one being the Plague Surgeon. This guy can attach into Plague Marines. He has the normal, basically standard Plague Marine character, Fetid Virian profile on his top line. He can attack with a Plague Bolt Pistol, a lethal hit Bolt Pistol that still is not actually a pistol. They, all of the data sheets apparently have that, and it allows the Plague Bolt Pistol to shoot in addition to other weapons. He can attack with a Bail Sword in melee. This is a lethal hit melee weapon attacking four times, hitting on threes at Strength 5, AP 2, 2 damage. Honestly, pretty decent profile. The most important thing, though, is that while he's attached to a unit, in your command phase, he regenerates a destroyed bodyguard model back to the unit, so anyone in his attached Plague Marine squad, but importantly, because he's a Fetid Virian, he can attach with another character, as long as you don't duplicate characters. He cannot regenerate the other characters, only bodyguards, so only the Plague Marines. If he is with another character and they take damage but don't die, maybe they take some sniper hits, he does have the diseased healing ability that allows you to heal a Death Guard infantry character, not a monster, so not Mortarian, within three inches of him for three wounds. I don't know how often this is going to come into play. Actually, I think it probably won't very much, but it is nice that he's here. Unfortunately, he can only attach to Plague Marines. If he could attach to Terminators, I think he would be amazing. Plague Marines, I'm not so sure about. Speaking of Plague Marines, however, we do have another Fetid Virian unit who can jump in there. This is the Tally Man. He has exactly the same profile that we've seen with all of the Death Guard foot characters, but he has an infected plasma pistol as his ranged weapon, which is pretty sweet. It is a normal plasma pistol in every way, except it has sustained hits D3. So it basically takes after the lantern, I guess, by getting additional hits on a critical hit roll. He has a four attack close combat weapon in melee, nothing special there, but obviously the tally man has always been taken for his special abilities. He gives you plus one to hit for his attached unit every time you make an attack, full stop. So that's pretty useful. And he has the seven fold chant. This triggers in your command phase. If he's on the battlefield, you roll a 2d6 on a seven you gain one CP. While this is the same ability that he had in previous editions, unfortunately, it does only come into play during your command phase, not every command phase. So he only gets one chance at it every battle round, not two like he did previously. Previously, that gave him an incredibly good chance to gain that command point, but now he doesn't look like he has that. Now, moving on to some more interesting units, we have the Death Shroud Terminators, and we theorized a lot about these guys in the video yesterday, and potentially whether or not they could be a strong combo with the Lord of Virulence. The Death Shroud Terminators come in at the standard Death Guard Terminator profile. They are a slow movement of six, tough to six, with a two plus save, three wounds, a leadership value of six, one objective control, and a baked in four plus and vulnerable save. They have the Plague Spurt Gauntlets. These things are anti-infantry four plus, pistol flamer weapons at a range 12, D6 shots at strength 3, AP0 for one damage. Basically exactly the same as we've seen them before, but with that very important anti-infantry, which makes them incredibly good at flinging enormous numbers of saves on enemies. Ignoring cover as well with these makes them very good into a wide variety of profiles. And if you get a reroll wounds effect on them, they're going to be pretty effective. In melee, they attack either four times with their strike man reaper profile or six times with their sweep. Each of these has lethal hits, and importantly, they no longer get a minus one to hit if they attack with their two-handed strike profile. This is four attacks hitting on twos at strength eight 
AP2 for two damage. And we can't forget that they will also be reducing the toughness value of enemy targets that they're hitting. So strength eight or strength nine targets, they're gonna be plus one to wound against. The sweet profile is six attacks hitting on twos at strength five AP zero, for one damage. Now, importantly, these guys are also the bodyguards of your Death Guard characters, and as a result, they have the silent bodyguard ability. While a character model is leading the unit, each time a target attacks the unit, if the strength characteristic is greater than the unit's toughness, you they get minus one to wound. So essentially, they're very rarely wounded on threes. You have to be strength 12 or higher to get them to wound on threes. Anything else is gonna wound them on a four. And lower strength attacks are probably gonna be wounding them on fours or fives anyway, and they're most likely gonna save on their impressive save character Characteristics, so you don't really need that. So most of the time, they're gonna be minus one to be wounded against the attacks that really matter. Now, who could join this unit? We do get another character spoiled, and this is Typhus, the host of the Destroyer Hive himself. He is a little bit faster than his Terminator brethren. He's actually moved five, but otherwise has basically the same profile we would expect. Toughness six with a two plus save, four plus invulnerable, six wounds, leadership six, and one objective control. In melee, he attacks with his mastercrafted Man Reaper, either striking five times, hitting on twos at strength nine AP two for three damage, or sweeping 10 times, hitting on twos at strength six AP one, one damage. In your shooting phase, he can also unleash the Eater Plague. This is a psychic power and works like other psychic powers we've seen. You select one enemy unit within 18 inches and visible to Typhus. On a one, he perils his and deals his unit D3 mortal wounds. On a two plus, he deals the enemy unit D6 mortal wounds. If you're lucky enough to roll a six, he deals them D3 plus three mortal wounds instead. The showcase for Thursday on the GW livestream was Craft World Elder versus Imperial Guard. And we got basically full detachment spoilers for these guys. So we actually now know all of the detachment mechanics for both Craft World Eldar and Imperial Guard and got a ton of data sheets spoiled. Let's start by diving into Imperial Guard and their mechanics. First off, we have a peek of all of their strats that the combined regiment is gonna unlock for you. The first one is Armored Might, which is a reactive defensive stratagem for two CP used in the opponent's shooting phase when they attack an Astra Militarum vehicle. It reduces damage of incoming attacks by one, and similar to the disgustingly resilient we saw from Death Guard, it does not have a minimum. So unless we see some additional addendums or clarifications, this can reduce damage to zero. Expert Bombardiers is used in your shooting phase for one CP, targets an Astra Militarum unit equipped with a Vox caster and a unit visible to that unit, and gives your non-battleshocked indirect fire units plus one to hit against the targeted enemy. Fields of Fire costs you two CP and is used before one of your regiment or squadron units shoots. After it has resolved its attacks, you choose one enemy unit that was targeted by the attacks. So you don't have to roll any hits, you just have to target them, and until the end of the shooting phase, you get plus one AP with your non-battleshocked regiment and squadron units targeting that. Inspired Command allows you to issue orders out of sequence. You use it in your opponent's command phase, and one officer from your army can issue one order as if it were your command phase. The restriction is that you can't issue that order to a battleshocked unit. Reinforcements we've already seen. It's used when a unit is destroyed and allows you to respawn them and add them back to strategic reserves. And Suppression Fire is used in your shooting phase for one command point. This targets one Astra Militarum infantry unit from your army that has not yet been selected to shoot and one non-monster or vehicle enemy. If the targeted Militarum unit hits the enemy one or more times, then that enemy gets minus one to hit until the end of your opponent's next turn. Imperial Guard are definitely gonna have a sub-theme of control effects and hit modifiers. So the effects like this are gonna be seen a lot more as we dive deeper into this army. We also see all of the enhancements available to characters in the detachment. The first one is Kirov's Aquila. This gives you an Agents of Vect style effect, just like we talked about with Kairos Fate Weaver. After an opponent uses a stratagem, you can increase the cost of that stratagem in the future by by one. The Death Mask of Alanius we already saw in the spoiler article. This reduces your objective control characteristic to one instead of zero if you fail your battle if you fail a battleshock check. Drill Commander gives your unit the ability to enhance their critical hits to five plus if they remain stationary. This basically will trigger alongside the Born Soldiers ability that they get to get lethal hits when they remain stationary and convert those lethal hits a little bit more efficiently. Last but certainly not at least the Grand Strategist Enhancement allows the bearer to issue one additional order. Now, one thing that was clarified on the live stream is exactly how enhancements work. And they did talk about how each of these enhancements, and there's gonna be four for each detachment, does cost a certain number of 
points, not command points, just regular points in your army, sort of like a chapter command effect that we saw from 9th and 8th edition. While these are a little hit or miss, this does mean that you're not obligated to choose enhancements, so you're not leaving any points or efficiency on the table if you just don't purchase them. That means they can make enhancements of wildly varying power level and don't really have to balance them against one another, and then just change the points values to be commensurate with their power level on the tabletop later on. Moving on to data sheets, we see one for the Death Core of Krieg. These guys can be taken in units of up to 20, just like the Cadian Shock Trooper squads we've seen previously. However, instead of having an objective secured effect, these dudes have the Grim Demeanor ability. This gives them plus one to hit if they are below their starting strength, plus one to wound if they are below half strength. There's a little bit of anti-synergy baked within the unit, however, and it's kind of a mini game to unlock this Grim Demeanor because they also have a Death Core meta pack. This regenerates D3 models to the unit at the start of each of your command phases. Hilariously, you have ways like Psychers in the unit or hazardous weapons to lose models of your own accord, which potentially will unlock your plus one to hit effect, but also those models will just regenerate later on. So you're free to equip as many hazardous weapons as you want and blast away overcharged every time, because as long as your medic is alive, those guys will continue to return to the fight. The platoon command squad can attach to the death core squad, regular infantry squad, or Canachin jungle fighters. This is composed of either a platoon commander and four veteran guardsmen, or three of those models, one platoon commander, two veteran guardsmen, and one heavy weapons team. While the veteran guardsmen are the same as any of the other guardsmen, the platoon commander comes in with three wounds instead of just one. They can equip a variety of ranged weapons. The platoon commander himself can take a power fist or a power sword in close combat, and they have a number of important war gear abilities and effects that they can add to their unit that they're leading. First off, they have the command structure ability. This allows you to use stratagems on battle shot units within six inches of the platoon commander, including the platoon commander himself. For the war gear that they equip, they can take a master vox, which increases the range of the orders they issue to 24 inches. It's important to note that the officer can issue one order to a regiment unit within that range, unless of course upgraded with the enhancement that we talked about earlier. A meta pack gives the entire unit the feel no plane six plus ability, which will affect the entire unit that he is added to as well. And similarly, a regimental standard gives plus one objective control to everyone in the unit, making all of those guardsmen that you're in objective control three. Additionally, you can also attach a Primaris Psyker to these units. And as we've seen with the infantry squads, they can have up to two characters attached as long as they don't have two command squads. The Primaris Psyker can compound how difficult these units are to kill because he does have the psychic barrier psychic power. This is used at the start of your opponent's shooting phase on a two plus. On a one, he takes D3 mortal wounds, just like all of the other Psykers we've seen. And again, this is to the unit themselves, so they may have a medipack in the unit to ignore those mortal wounds on a six, and even if he kills a couple of models, if they are in a death core squad, their medic are just going to get those guys back up. However, on a two plus, he grants the entire unit a four plus invulnerable save, which is pretty good. He also gives them all a four plus feel no pain against psychic attacks. He does have a psychic attack himself. He can fire his psychic maelstrom, either the normal attack firing D6 shots at an 18 inch range at strength six AP two for one damage. It does have the blast and devastating wounds abilities, or he can focus it to fire D6 plus three instead at two damage instead of one. He also slaps kind of hard in melee. He attacks three times hitting on fours at strength six AP one D3 damage with his force weapon. Now he actually has a wide variety of units he can attach to. It's not just the um, it's not just the infantry squads, Kedachin jungle fighters, and Death Corps like we've seen the other guys attached to. He can also attach to Kazarkin or Tempestus Scions. The same goes for the next character we're going to talk about, Lord Solar Leontis himself. He can attach to the same. While well, he can't attach to Tempestus Scions, he can attach to Adelin Rough Riders instead. But otherwise, he has the same options. He himself is a 12-inch move T4 three plus save model with a four plus invulnerable save, eight wounds, a six plus leadership and objective control value. His abilities are a lot less impactful than we saw in ninth edition, but I think he is commensurately going to be much easier to include in your armies because he's not the same powerhouse that he was. He's mostly just a little bit of an army support character. First off, he gets you a CP at the start of your command phase just for free. You don't have to roll. You don't have to roll to regenerate anything. You just get one. He also has the collegiate Astrolex. This allows you to redeploy up to three Astro Militarum units from your army after both players have deployed. They can be put into strategic reserves or 
just redeployed normally. He is the most effective of officers, and with orders not splashing so much anymore, having additional orders in your army is going to be important, which is good because he can issue up to three orders, and he is still pretty solid at fighting. His pistol shoots three times at range 12, hitting on twos at strength 8 AP2 for two damage, and his melee weapon attacks six times, hitting on twos with strength 6 AP2 for two damage. Constantine, his horse also kicks you two times in melee, hitting on fours, at strength 4 AP 0 for 1 damage, and those are extra attacks, so he gets them alongside his sword. We also saw the profile for the Torox. We saw this one previewed a little bit because of the Rapid Deployment ability. This gives it the ability to disembark after the Torox has advanced, giving you a little bit of extra threat range to potentially be performing actions or grabbing objectives farther than you would normally be able to. But otherwise, this thing is a move 12, toughness 8, so a little bit lower than the other vehicles we've seen. It is kind of a lightly armored vehicle. Three plus save, 10 wound, leadership 7, objective control 2, transport. It can transport up to 12 infantry models, heavy weapon teams count as 2, and ogrens count as 3. On its turret, it mounts a twin auto cannon. This has the strength 9 AP1 3 damage auto cannon profile that we've seen before, but it is twin linked, so it does get to reroll its wound rolls, and it can also mount pintle storm bolters. Heavy weapon squads are also listed here. They're basically two wound guardsmen profiles with an objective control value of two. A lot of the heavy weapons that we see these guys equip have the profiles that we would expect, but a lot of them hit on fives and have to rely on that heavy weapon ability to get plus one to hit to get back to hitting on fours, which is a little bit sad. That said, they do have the covering fire ability, which allows them to hit on overwatch attacks on a five instead of a six, and improving that to a four if they're within six inches of one or more friendly platoon units. This can make it so they're actually more effective at firing Overwatch than they are at firing normally during your shooting phase, which is a little bit silly, but I think gives them an important use case of keeping enemies off of your platoon units as they're moving up the table to take objectives. Rattling snipers also see a return. These are little move six, toughness two, six plus save, one wound, eight plus leadership, objective control, one infiltrators. They do have the stealth ability, so they are minus one to be hit with ranged attacks and have the shoot, sharp, and scarper ability as well. This allows them after they shoot, if they are not within engagement range, to make a normal move as if it were your movement phase. They cannot charge after they do so. Their range attacks are actually pretty impressive. They have sniper rifles, which are ballistic skill three heavy weapons, so they can go to hitting on twos if they remain stationary, and then obviously are available to move immediately after that with their special ability. They have the precision ability and hit at strength four AP two for two damage, which is a very meaty sniper profile. And I think we're gonna see a lot of characters running scared from these guys because two AP2 two damage is enough to punch through a lot of these three plus or four plus save four wound infantry. But with that, let's move on to the true power of the Astra Militarum, their big artillery. The Basilisk is a move 10, toughness nine, three plus save, 11 wound, seven leadership and three objective control vehicle. It is equipped with the Earthshaker Cannon, a 240 inch range, D6 plus three shot, four plus ballistic skill, strength eight, AP2, two damage ranged weapon. They also have hunter killers, which were confirmed to actually be free of charge in the new edition. So everything that can have a hunter killer should have a hunter killer. If they hit you with that big Earthshaker cannon shot, the Earthshaker rounds ability comes into play. After this model has shot, if you scored a hit against an enemy infantry unit until the end of your opponent's next turn, that unit is shaken. That gives it minus two to its movement characteristic and minus two to both advance and charge rolls made for it. These are some of the disruptive effects that we can expect to see from Astra Militarum in this combined arms detachment and in their new codex. The Wyvern also has a similar style. It has the same top line profile, but instead fires with its Wyvern quad storm shard mortar. This thing has an absolute bevy of special weapon abilities abilities attached to it. It is blast, ignoring cover, heavy, indirect fire, and twin linked. So it's going to be able to fire out of line of sight, able to counteract that indirect fire penalty by getting plus one to hit from heavy, ignoring cover, and rerolling all of its wound rolls. It fires at 48 inches for 2d6 shots, hitting on fours at strength five. Remember, rerolling wounds though, AP zero for one damage. Now, that profile is not the best. It is going to be able to clear light infantry pretty well, but the reason that you're taking it is the suppression bombardment ability. This gives minus one to hit until the start of your next turn to a unit that is not a monster or vehicle that this thing hit with its mortar. But unlike the Basilisk's Earthshaker, it does 
not have to hit infantry. It can hit mounted units, for example, and still impose that minus one to hit effect. And importantly, this is minus one to hit with all of their attacks. So it also basically makes your army more resilient against enemy ranged attacks. Now, all this artillery is great, but they do need some support. And that comes in the form of the Scout Sentinel. These guys have a nine inch scout move that they use before the game starts. And once the game has begun, our move 10, toughness seven, with a impressive three plus save, seven wounds, seven leadership, and an OC value of two. Basically the kingdom of sevens over here. These guys are basically a Nurgle unit at this point. They can equip a variety of heavy weapons that we've seen before. And again, importantly, can also take that hunter killer missile, which is going to be free. They can also mount a sentinel chainsaw attacking three times, hitting on fours at strength six AP one for one damage. But the real reason you're taking them is the daring recon ability, which at the start of your shooting phase allows you to select one enemy unit within 18 inches and visible to the Sentinel. Until the end of the phase, each Astra Militarum model that fires at that unit rerolls ones to hit and ignores the hit penalty for firing indirectly at them, allowing you to get your artillery on target with extreme efficiency. These guys look absolutely insane and even better because they have the regimental keyword. So if you have units of three scout Sentinels, they're able to buff the rest of your army, do a little bit of damage, but then also respawn thanks to the reinforcement stratagem if your opponent kills them. Now, last but certainly not least, in this video, we'll talk about some Craft World Eldar. And we got a huge number of spoilers for the Eldar. Not only a lot of their data sheets, but also all of the detachment abilities. The stratagems available for the Battle Host Detachment are Phantasm, which is usable at the end of the opponent's movement phase and allows one of your Eldar units to move up to seven inches with the restriction that it cannot embark in a transport. You also cannot then heroically intervene with the unit and cannot use the stratagem if you're within engagement range. Feigned Retreat allows you to fall back, shoot and charge for one CP, usable in your movement phase when an Eldar unit makes a fallback move. Matchless Agility allows you to advance six inches rather than rolling normally. The Bladestorm ability gives you plus two armor penetration characteristic on critical wounds for one Eldar unit during your own shooting phase, basically granting you the shuriken effect back. But importantly, this works on weapons that aren't normally shuriken weapons. Lightning Fast Reactions is a one CP reactive stratagem using either in the shooting or fight phase and gives one of your units that is targeted by enemies minus one to be hit. Importantly, it cannot be used on Wraith constructs. The enhancements available to Eldar mesh extremely well with their fate dice mechanics. They can equip the Weeping Stones, which allow you to gain an additional fate dice each time the bearer's unit destroys an enemy. Reader of the Runes allows you to reroll one of your fate dice that's in your fate dice pool in each of your command phases, basically giving you five slightly more useful fate dice. Fate's Messenger allows you to turn a hit roll, wound roll, or saving throw for a model in the bearer's unit to an unmodified six once per turn. So that's usable both in your turn and in your opponent's turn. And the Phoenix Gem allows the bearer to regenerate on a two plus after destroyed, coming back with its full runes remaining. Now we can move into some data sheets and we see the more aggressive compatriots of the Guardian Squad represented here with the Storm Guardians. These guys have the exact same profile as standard Guardians, but are able to take a number of melee weapons or some aggressive special weapons, including an Eldar Flamer, which is uh, just a normal Flamer, but it has Assault, a Fusion Gun, an Assault Melta weapon that is, unfortunately for it, only Strength 8, but it is Melta 2, and Shuriken Pistols, which we can also see have both the Assault and Pistol characteristic. These guys have the Storm Blades ability. This gives them an objective secured effect. If they hold an objective at the end of your command phase, it locks in under your control until your opponent comes and takes it. Just like the standard Guardians can mount a special weapon platform, these guys can take a Serpent Shield platform, which gives the entire unit a five plus invulnerable save. Eldar Rangers are a powerful utility unit, but importantly are no longer battle lines. So while in previous editions they were troops for the Eldar army, that has not carried over. They're equipped with the Ranger Long Rifle, a, for some reason, just strictly worse version of the Imperial Sniper Rifle, having the same keywords, uh, but coming in at only AP1 instead of AP2, and Shuriken Pistols as well. They have the Infiltrators and Stealth Abilities, who are minus one to be hit and can deploy out in front of your army. And while they do have a five plus base save, they no longer have a Chameleon Line Cloak, but instead have a five plus invulnerable save against ranged attacks. They have the Path of the Outcast ability, which once per turn, after an 
enemy unit ends a normal move, advance, or fall back within 9 inches of them allows them to move d6 inches as if it were your movement phase. Now we've already seen the foot variety of the Farseer, but we've also gotten spoiled the Farseer Skyrunner. This is a 14 inch move flying mounted character with toughness 4 with a 3 plus save, 4 plus invulnerable save, 5 wounds, a leadership of 6, and OC value of 2. Unlike the Foot Farseer, these guys are not protecting your units, but instead guiding them. This allows them in your command phase on the roll of a 2 plus to give an Eldar unit within 12 inches full hit rerolls until your next command phase. Similarly to the Foot based Farseer, they also have the Branching Fates ability. They also have basically an identical selection of ranged and melee weapons. These guys can be brought alongside Warlock Skyrunners. These have a very similar profile, but come in at only three wounds. Their Psychic Output is a little bit different. They don't do as much damage, but their Destructor is a Torrent weapon rather than a Blast weapon. Instead of buffing other units in your army, the Warlocks are going to be able to buff the unit that they are attached with. In their Command Phase, thanks to their Runes of Battle ability, they get to choose one effect to grant their unit, either Conceal, which gives the unit stealth, or Reveal, which allows the unit to ignore cover, dramatically improving the damage output of those relatively mediocre Shuriken Catapults. Both the Farseer Skyrunner and the Warlock Skyrunner can attach into Windriders. The Farseer Skyrunner can also be attached to Warlock Skyrunner Conclaves, and importantly, both of them can attach together into a single unit. The Windrider, uh, the Windrider profile that these guys can attach into two has basically the same top line profile as the rest of the characters, but at only two wounds and not with having an invulnerable save. They have the scatter laser, shuriken cannon, or twin shuriken catapult options that we've seen previously, but they also have the swift demise ability. This gives them reroll hit rolls of one against the closest target. However, if they target the, an enemy within range of an objective marker your opponent controls, and they are still the closest, you can get full hit rerolls. Alongside their twin shuriken catapult having the twin linked characteristic, they're literally going to have full rerolls, rolling both to hit and to wound with those twin linked weapons. Moving on to the ground pounding Eldar units, we see Dire Avengers. These guys have the basic guardian profile essentially, but a five plus invulnerable save. They are equipped with Avenger Shuriken catapults, assault and lethal hit range weapons attacking at 18 inches with three shots hitting on threes at strength four AP one, one damage. Their Exarch can equip either a Dire Sword, a three attack devastating wounds weapon that hits on threes at strength four AP two, or a Power Glaive, which basically just trades the devastating wounds for plus one strength. He can also equip a Shimmer Shield for a four plus invulnerable save. And the real headliner of the unit is their defense tactics ability, which very similar to the heavy weapons team that we talked about in the IG section, gives them a buff to their Overwatch ability, either allowing them to hit on fives rather than sixes, or allowing them to hit on fours if they are in range of an objective marker that you control. This is further buffed by the attachment of their Phoenix Lords. That's right, the Phoenix Lords are now attachments for their aspect units, not independent characters like they were previously. They're not really meant to go out on their own and do stuff. They're meant to buff a unit of their aspect warriors. Azurmen is a move seven toughness three infantry with a two plus save, three plus invulnerable save, five wounds, a six plus leadership, and one objective control. He has lost a lot in terms of his base profile from his previous edition, but he still hits pretty hard. He has the bloody twins, six shot, 24 inch range, assault lethal hit pistol weapons that hit on twos at strength four AP one for two damage. In melee, he swings six times, hitting on twos at strength six AP three for three damage with the devastating really wounding Sword of Azure. He grants the unit that he is leading plus one to hit, and he can only join units of Dire Avengers, but he allows those Dire Avengers to hit on twos with their normal attacks. However, he also has the Tactical Acumen ability. This allows you to use Fire Overwatch on his unit once per turn, and you can do it even if you've already fired Overwatch earlier in the turn. This is a very impressive ability because Eldar have such an interaction with the Overwatch mechanic. Because they have Strands of Fate dice that they can use to automatically guarantee their Overwatch shots, being able to Overwatch with a big tank firing a Bright Lance that's automatically gonna hit and wound, and a bunch of Dire Avengers at the same time is absolutely insane. Moving on to other Aspect Warrior 
warriors, we also see warp spiders. And these guys are ludicrous in this edition. They've gotten an enormous glow up, and while they don't do as much damage as they did previously, they are way more flexible. They have a base movement of 12 inches at toughness three with a three plus save, one wound apiece at leadership six with one objective control. The Exarch is the same, but has two wounds, and each of them are equipped with death spinners. I think the Exarch is most likely gonna have two of these things. These are torrent devastating wound weapons that fire 12 inches for D6 shots, strength four, AP zero for one damage. Basically a flamer profile, but trading ignore cover for that devastating wounds, which I think generally is gonna be a trade up. The Exarch has his power blades. These are three attack melee weapons that hit on threes at strength four, AP two for one damage. But the real reason you're taking these guys is their flicker jump ability. This allows you in the movement phase when the unit makes a normal move to instead flicker jump, which changes the movement characteristic of the unit from 12 up to 24, but gives them a one in six chance to suffer a single mortal wound, which is basically not even an issue. They can't charge in the same turn that they flicker jump, but this makes them enormously useful at pouncing on enemy objectives, running behind their lines and bouncing around the table. Moving on to some additional aspect warriors, we also see the Striking Scorpions and their Phoenix Lord, Karandras. The Striking Scorpions themselves have the same base profile as the Warp Spiders. They can fire with Shuriken Pistols or the Scorpion Claw, which is two Shuriken Pistols stapled together, basically. And in melee, each of them attacks with a Scorpion Chainsword, a sustained hits one four attack weapon at strength four AP zero for one damage. All of their weapons do have that sustained hits effect, so regardless of whether or not the Exarch is taking the Biting Blade or Scorpion's Claw. He's going to be getting that Exploding Sixes. The Binding Blade attacks five times, hitting on threes at strength five, AP one for two damage, and the Scorpion's Claw reduces its number of attacks down to four and hits on fours instead of threes, but at strength eight, AP two for two damage. These guys retain their Infiltrator's ability, and when attacking non-monstrant vehicles, they get devastating wounds thanks to their Manda Blasters. While they're significantly less dangerous as they were in the previous edition, they are still gonna be equally as good at clearing away Chaff Infantry, which is exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Karandras can be added to the unit as well. He has the same profile as Azerman, but a four plus invulnerable save rather than a three. He's equipped with Aura's Bane, an assault pistol weapon that's basically the same as the Scorpion's Claw, but is strength five instead of strength four and hits on twos. In melee, he can either swing with his Claw, five attacks with sustained hits, hitting on twos at strength eight AP three, two damage, or his sword, which also has sustained hits, but attacks eight times, hitting on twos at strength six AP one for one damage. Now, importantly, Karandras gets a bunch of huge buffs when he charges. Just like Azerman, he does his unit plus one to hit, so everybody's going to be hitting on twos, generally speaking, which means with sustained hits, they should be converting about 100% of their attacks. When Karandras charges, he gains the sustained assault ability, which allows him to score critical hits on hit rolls of four rather than just six. This means he triggers all of those sustained hits effects 50% of the time. So instead of one in six chance to get an additional hit, he gets a one in four. And he gets devastating wounds against anything that isn't Titanic. So because his Manda Blasters are big and scary, he gets a much improved variety and it doesn't work just against infantry and mounted enemies. And with that, we can move on to some of the terrifying Eldar armor. The first one we have to talk about is the Wave Serpent. These things are gonna be 14 inch move at T9, a three plus save and five plus invulnerable save thanks to that Serpent's Shield, 13 wounds with a leadership value of six and two objectives control. The Wave Serpent Shield uh, is honestly a little bit borked. Previously, it gave them another defensive effect, either a transhuman effect or minus one damage against the vehicle until you expended it doing mortal wounds. Now they just have an invulnerable save, and while they can't expend their Serpent Shield, it doesn't remove their saving throw. The Serpent Shield allows you to, once per battle, fire it at a unit within 12 inches and visible to the Wave Serpent and deal them D3 mortal wounds and a battle shock check on a two plus. The reason that it's worked, however, is that it actually doesn't tell you when you're supposed to use it. So theoretically, you can use it whenever, such as, for example, after an enemy unit passes a Battleshock check during their Battleshock step, you could potentially force them to immediately take another one or use it just before your opponent is gonna use some powerful stratagem on them. Uh, it's probably meant to be used like in your shooting phase or something, but they maybe forgot to write that down. Otherwise, it can equip a wide variety of twin-linked heavy weapons on its turret. 
Basically, we've seen all these profiles before, but they do have the twin linked effect. I do think that maybe twin shuriken cannons or scatter lasers, because of all those rerolls you get, are going to be pretty useful. The fire prism, we've basically already seen a lot about in the previous faction articles. We've seen the effects of the prism cannon and its very powerful linked fire ability. This one comes in at 12 wounds instead of the 13 of the wave serpent and has the crystal matrix ability. This gives it a floating hit reroll and wound reroll on top of the one you get from the Eldar detachment rule. Essentially, Essentially, this prism cannon firing two shots with its focused fire, hitting on threes at strength 18, AP 4, 6 damage, is going to be able to reroll literally every one of those dice rolls. It gets two rerolls to hit and two rerolls to wound, which means that it can reroll at every step of the process. Its attacks are extremely reliable. Moving on to some of the lighter vehicles, Vipers make a return. These are 14 inch move fly vehicles at toughness 6, a 3 plus save with 6 wounds, a 6 plus leadership value, and an OC value of 2. Just like the Wave Serpents, they can equip a variety of heavy weapons that we've basically all seen before. However, they have the harassment fire ability. After it has shot, you can choose one enemy unit hit by its attacks. And importantly, it is equipped with an underslung twin shuriken catapult as well as its top turret gun, which means that you can fire two separate units and then choose one of them to be affected by this effect. There's no roll involved, it just happens. And when you choose to use the ability, the enemy unit doesn't benefit from cover. So that that's really that's really good. Vipers seem great. Warwalkers similarly have have a very impressive profile. These guys, thanks to those little power fields, are kind of like uber tanks. They have a 10 inch movement, a toughness of seven, a higher toughness than the Viper, a three plus save, six wounds, six plus leadership, and an objective control value of two. Importantly, they have a four plus invulnerable save and a power field, which gives them minus one to be wounded from ranged attacks. They also have the nine inch scout ability, so they get a pregame move of up to nine inches and can mount two of the heavy weapons that we discussed previously. Now, last Last but certainly not least, and I think again another transformative unit to the Eldar faction, are the support weapon platforms. These have always had an interesting place in the faction just given the fact that they have been able to mount a variety of very useful utility weapons, and whatever you need in the metagame, they probably have uh, an answer for you. They're three inch move vehicles, which is very slow, at toughness six with a four plus save, five wounds, a six plus leadership and objective control value of one. They have the artillery barrage ability. This is basically identical to the wyvern ability. They pick a non monster or vehicle that was hit by their attacks and it gets minus one to hit until your next turn. Importantly, it is non monster or vehicle unty. Now the weapons that they can equip have a wide variety of profiles and regardless of which weapon they use, they all get the effect of this artillery barrage. So if they fire at non monsters or vehicles, they're going to be imposing that minus one to hit, which is really good. The first one they have is the Shadow Weaver. This is a devastating wound blast weapon with the heavy ability and indirect fire, allowing it to shoot through walls. It fires 48 inch range for D6 plus two shots, hitting on threes at strength six, AP zero, one damage. And if you want to apply this artillery barrage effect to random enemy units, this is going to be the one to pick. Uh, the heavy effect now allowing them to ignore the indirect fire penalty is a huge deal for these guys, and it makes the support weapon platform much more reliable than it was in the past. The Vibro Cannon shoots 48 inches, is not indirect fire, so it does have to shoot directly, hitting on threes at strength 8, AP 1, 2 damage. This one doesn't seem that good, but I imagine will be the cheapest variety. Lastly, and probably the most terrifying, the D Cannon makes a return. This is a D three shot 24 inch range blast weapon with heavy and indirect fire as we could expect so it fires through walls and can potentially counteract a lot of the indirect fire penalty by remaining stationary however it also has wait for it Devastating wounds. <laughs> Eldar are a faction with strands of fate so you can sub in sixes to wound for this guy and convert its d6 plus two damage into mortal wounds. It hits on a three normally at strength 16 AP four. So it's normal attacks do have a pretty good chance of wounding whatever it's shooting at. But the fact that it can now convert those attacks into mortal wounds and just destroy infantry units, multi wounders or punch through the most insane saving throws imaginable is absolutely insane. And the only thing I think restricting the D cannon from being insanely nuts is the fact that it uh, does only have a 27 inch threat range. That said, there's going to be some situations in this new edition where those D cannon platforms can just sit within range of an objective and fire away indiscriminately, dealing ridiculous numbers of mortal wounds to anything that's hapless enough to be caught in their arc of fire. I'm really hoping that these things are extremely expensive because uh, they seem real good. 
And with that, that is all of the data sheets that we got spoiled over the course of the live streams today. So many data sheets, and we basically have almost the entirety of the rules for Craft World Eldar, Demons, most of them for Death Guard, and a lot for Imperial Guard. So while we don't have all the data sheets yet, and of course we're still waiting on points values, Alongside the missions that were played on live stream today and a lot of them that I talked about in my video yesterday, we can basically start to play games of 10th edition. Let me know down in the comment section what you think about these data sheets and if you're going to be getting some games in with them anytime soon. Eldar seem a little powerful, but we'll have to see how things shake out and Imperial Guard are looking very cool too. I do like the fact that the entire mechanic of Imperial Guard is gonna be focused around suppression and keeping your opponent basically locked in their deployment zone so that they stay away from your squishy infantry squads. So thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Big thanks as well to everybody who supports the channel, either over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise, YouTube channel members and Twitch subscribers. All you people are freaking so cool. I love you. Remember to keep it classy folks and have happy wargaming.